What region is the best at Smash Ultimate? Oh, it, it's Japan? Okay, word. Thanks for watching. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, stop. Surely we can't just leave it at that. I mean, does everyone think Japan is the best at Smash Ultimate? They do? <clears throat> uh, okay, alright, yeah, thanks for watching. Okay, actually, we should probably dig into this a little bit more. Why does it feel so universally known that Japan just completely clears versus every other region when it comes to this game? A Banjo player 3-0'd MKLeo, 4 Japanese players make up the top 10, half of the top 20 are from Japan, and 12 Japanese players have already won majors? This guy plays Pac-Man, this guy plays Sora, why are players from Japan so much better? Once a year in Japan, a very special time called Golden Week comes around. A week in which most major companies and schools are closed for a string of 4 national holidays in the period of 7 days. For most of the country, this is a time to relax and enjoy some time off, but for the strongest Smash Ultimate players in Japan, this would amount to be one of the biggest weeks in Smash Ultimate's nearly five-year-long history. With a trio of events taking place and the added pressure of the defending champion of their biggest major series, Kagaribi, coming to reclaim the throne, it was unclear what the results of the weekend would be. Japan's scene was strong, that much was certain, but would they have what it takes to beat this imposing force? Well, what if I were to also tell you that the biggest piece of news that broke this weekend wasn't one particular upset or placement, but rather the initiation of a new narrative on the scene. North American Smash is actually kinda cooked. It's over. They're done for. Look, we know Japan's Smash scene to be one of, if not the strongest in the entire world. Their depth and range of talent is what sets them apart from other Smash scenes. Sure, North America and Europe have top reps from around their regions that can dance with the best of Japan, but once you go down that list and account for the major distance between these players in NA and EU, you come to find a much deeper iceberg from the Japanese scene. Because of this, the events in Japan have been seen as the toughest in the world for years now. During last year's Golden Week, there was a trio of majors in Meisuma Top 12, Delta 4, and Kagari B10, where the first two were taken by Akola and Mia respectively. But the real challenge would be at Japan's premier event and their biggest one of the year, Kagaribi. Showcasing a maxed out 1,024 player bracket, Kagaribi really could have gone to anyone. But after falling to Yara 3-0 early in winner's top 64, Spargo climbed his way back with one of the best losers runs of the year. This included beating Mia and notably double eliminating Akola in grand finals, only dropping a single game in the process. Spargo was pronounced the victor and crowned as the first and only player outside of Japan to win a Japanese major in Ultimate history, which quite honestly really attests to the strength of the Japanese scene. And outside of Spargo, the other players did really well, honestly. DeBuzz pulled together a legendary run to fourth place at Kagaribi, Zamba got a solid ninth at Kagaribi, and Riddles actually managed to top eight all three events on that weekend. It felt pretty safe to say that the North American scene showed their strength when traveling overseas, just as the Japanese scene does to them throughout the year. But that wasn't always the case, and, well, they say history has has the tendency to repeat itself. So, uh... Knowing this, when international competition hears about a prospect like Golden Week, where you get to visit during a week that features two or three of the most prestigious events in the country, filled to the brim with the best talent Japan has to offer, how could you possibly pass up on that? Well, for this year, Golden Week brought Spargo, Gluttony, MKLeo, Zamba, Meister, and even more to top that off. It wasn't as deep with international talent as Kagari B10 was, but it was definitely a step up from 11, where the only notable international talent was the top-level Roy Flo from France. So, with all that out of the way, we can go back to our thesis. Is NA truly cooked? Let's find out. To truly kick off this historic weekend, we had the eighth iteration of the Delta series, the first of the pair of premieres, and for the international competitors, a bit of foreshadowing for how the rest of the weekend was going to go. And yes, I said premieres, aka P tiers, which are the highest tier on the current Lumi Rank tournament ranking system, and Delta was run in just a single day, which is insane and also very impressive, but oh my god, it was such a crazy day. Let's go. Okay, let's start with some of the good for NA. MKLeo held it down as the highest placing international player at 9th, coming in right at his projected 11th seed, and that's it. Zamba out at 13th to Tamapi and Raru, Meister out at 25th to Tamapi and Leaf, Big Boss out at 65th to Siriyuki and Rimu. Many of NA and Beyond's finest fell early on in this bracket. Hell, even some of Japan's best like Ashimo, Toriguri, and Zakrai heavily underperformed their seeds. But it was North America's number one representative and the man known to be defending champion in the country, Spargo, that fell the hardest out of the bunch. He got 13th, losing to Rarikusu's Donkey Kong and Level 1's Toon Link. Yeah, these dudes in Japan are just built different. 
Now, Donkey Kong is notably a pretty volatile matchup for Cloud, but Cloud has consistently ranked as one of Toon Link's worst matchups since the previous Smash title. His decision making was, we'll just leave it at interesting at different points, but that was the event for him, 13th place. It wasn't uncommon to see these kinds of results being traded between the competitors in Japan, but to see a player that's at the level of Spargo fall to two characters far out of what is considered conventional or strong in the competitive scene shows a changing meta in Ultimate. We're at the point where most players have realized that, while some characters might provide you stronger tools to win with, you truly can beat just about anyone with any character in the roster if you're good enough. There's also the factor of being the player to beat at the tournament. It's not that unlikely that everyone in your path is preparing specifically for you, and they have some counterplay ready to go, but that isn't an excuse. Akola, Mia, Hurt, and the other dozens of other top Japanese reps have to deal with their contemporaries as well as being on the flip side of the situation when they travel to the US. So yeah, the event was absolutely littered with upsets from the first wave of pools all the way to the final phases of the bracket, especially upon the international talent in attendance. But again, this was just a single day event, and for most competitors, the follow-up tournament, Kagari B12, was the event to be at. So, did they perform any better there? Well, no, oh God, no, no, stop, C please stop, yep. Okay, once again, NA came up short, this time failing to manage a top 12 spot. At 33rd, we had Base Mage, MK Big Boss, and Spargo, yep. Well, uh, okay, we'll get back to that one in a second. 25th had Zamba, MK Leo, Jazo, and Goblin, and all the way at 13th, we had the highest placing NA competitor, Meister, who fell just a stock away from making it into the top eight qualifier. Oh, uh, yeah, there's Big D as well. That's that's rough, buddy. Even removing the outlier that was Big D, NA combined for a minus 14 SPR rating, and some of our top players took some very rough losses. Zamba fell to Lax's Krom, who he'd beaten the day before at Delta. MKLeo had the unfortunate luck of running into a pair of apparent kryptonites, Mario and Steve. Meister went on a great run until he got his soul absolutely read by Dormigi, and Spargo? Well, I don't really know what to say for Spargo. Given all that he was capable of performing on that given day, he fell short to two incredible players in Toriguri and Nui. I'd say for most, including himself, this wasn't the result he was looking for. The player who had been seen as the counter to Japan's strongest throughout 2023 had fallen far before he had a chance to even reach any of those players he was historically so strong against. It was a hard pill to swallow for both fans of the North American scene and Spargo. Now, these results sound bad, and they are. <laughs> But the response from the community was honestly even more harsh. Not only were they bombarded by memes on social media, but a new narrative was brewing among some players in the scene. North American Smash just can't keep up anymore. Of course, there's always another event to go and redeem yourself at. Hell, Spargo was the Kagari B10 champion after all, but at this moment in time, NA just had to hold the L. So now, let's really dive into this and see if these claims have some truth to them or if they're simply hyperbole. Japan vs NA, but more specifically the US, has been a lifetime rivalry in the competitive Smash scene dating all the way back to Captain Jack vs Ken in Melee. They've long been known for not just their mastery of the game's top tiers, but many character specialists pushing the boundaries of these characters written off as irrelevant in North America's scene. I mean, just look at some of the videos we've posted so far. But this has led to some anomalies and crazy statistics like Ocean upsetting Mewtwo King with Rob, and in the process was subject to one of the hardest photos of all time. God damn! Otori winning the biggest brawl tournament of all time, Apex 2012, despite never even winning a local event in Japan, or the fact that a Japanese player has won a US major in every single Smash title. The NA scene can't say the same, but in this over two decade long rivalry, more often than not, a North American player at least managed to make it into top eight. Ken famously won Jack Garden Tournament in 2005 over Bomb Soldier. Vinny and M2K top 8 Sunrise Tournament in 2012 to lose to a Japanese legend, Rain. In Smash 4, NA farmed Japan in their own region, winning 3 out of 4 of the majors with the top NA player in attendance in that game's lifespan. And at that fourth event, it was a runner-up performance from DeGoat. Even at Umabura Japan Major 2019, MKLeo's worst performance of his whole Smash career, Cosmos managed to clutch up and secure a fourth place. Looking through every major that has had more than a single top North American rep in attendance, we'll find that NA's worst overall performance took place at the beginning of the year, Umabura SP10, where Zamba came in at 9th. This was the first time North America missed out on getting a single player into top 8 at a Japanese major in Smash history. To follow that statistic with another, perhaps even more devastating one, having your first time missing out on top 12 this year when you had an even stronger roster of players attending is not a good look. So what does this say about the NA scene? What's so different about Japan that makes even the early rounds of these events so volatile to upsets to where even the most consistent of top players are falling remarkably early? In general, from accounts of many 
different players, it seems that the collective understanding of the game among the average player base in Japan is much higher, along with having the mindset more oriented towards growth than many in North America. Maybe it's the fact that there's no money on the line in their events, and they truly play for the love of the game. But let's be honest, if you're good enough to be a top player anywhere in the world, you'd probably love this game, even if it does feel like a toxic relationship sometimes. Others say it could be the difference in online, and that Japan's combination of more consistent internet and the powerhouse that is Smashmate being present gives every player access to good, consistent, try-hard practice at their fingertips. <laughs> Well, North America has imitators of Smashmate, and from what it seems, they unfortunately died off pretty quickly compared to the type of audience Smashmate has built through their near decade-long existence. Also, Spargo is easily one of the biggest Wi-Fi grinders in the world. For a while, he was playing Sonics and winners in grand finals of Coinbox every single week, and yet he's still underperformed in the fashion he did. Competing in anything is a journey consisting of peaks and valleys. Sometimes you're high, and sometimes you're low. Yet, no matter how hard things get, you're still on that same path, working towards the same goal. It's up to you to find the motivation to keep pushing, but given their circumstances, they gave us all they were able to under the conditions present at that exact moment in time, and that's all you could really ask for. Now, there is some hope for the North American scene still. Akola hasn't taken his talents overseas this year, but the scene has managed to overall hold it down. Nearly halfway into 2024, Japan has only managed to win one event in North America, that being Hurt at Battle BC6. At three separate majors prior to Kagaribi, all on NA soil, the scene has managed to successfully defend against players like Mia, T, Shutone, Ken, and more. On top of that, this trip was primarily the Mexican Smash scene along with a few US reps and Big D against Japan's Dream Team. It truly doesn't grasp the scope of what NA could do against Japan at full power. Just for reference, in attendance were 2023's number 1, 6, 10, 21, 23, 34, and 41 on the North American Lumi rank. A stacked lineup for sure, and of course there's Spargo who's been consistently one of the best players in the world against Japan's top players, but North America did have a few aces that weren't in attendance. This was a group of the best players in the region that have never taken their talents to Japan before that I feel could truly have a chance of top 8-ing or even winning. And yes, this is only players who haven't traveled to Japan. I don't want to see any where's riddles or zomba comments, but if you do want to leave them, it does help for you know, just leave a comment. Let's start with the player that has gone on arguably the biggest rise in 2024, Shattuck. Shattuck has taken a massive leap over the past year from a very solid player to arguably one of the best in the US, currently piloting a solo Corrin. Between other reps like Neo and Lai, Corrin has seen some strong results in Japan and the players are likely more experienced than the average US competitor would be before facing off against Shattuck. But this guy has proved time and time again, it doesn't matter how much experience you have or who you are, he's taken this character to a seemingly new level. Now, there is something to mention about Shattuck and it's that he has by far the least head-to-head -head results against these Japanese competitors. He's only been a consistent top-level player since around the end of 2023, and his wins have been against mainly US's top players. Despite this lack of matchups, there is some notable context to take from these encounters though. His 1-0 against Yara is huge since Shattuck is historically bad against Samus with an all-time losing record at a high level, but Shattuck destroyed Yara here. He was down 2-1, but once Game 4 started, Shattuck proceeded to double 3 stock him, winning Games 4 and 5. Shattuck's 1-1 one -on -one records against both Neo and Mia are also important to note as well. Both set losses were 3-2s, and he followed it up by vigorously defeating them in their next encounters. The lack of data points might scare some, but with the competitor as adaptive and fast as Shattuck, along with the matchups he's proven to be effective in, it's likely Shattuck would do just fine overseas. Next, we have one of the goats of United States Smash throughout Ultimate's lifespan, Tweak. His playstyle is a remnant of an older era of Smash, but it's still as effective in 2024 as it was in 2016. Conquering Japan's best has always been an issue for Tweak, having zero set wins all time against Akola, Mia, and even peak Zachary, but it's been about five years since those two have encountered each other. What he has proved, though, is consistent dominance against the country's other strongest competitors. He's undefeated all time against both Shutone and Ken, along with having winning records against Tama P, Proto Banham, Gact, and he even managed to beat T in Pac-Man vs. Diddy at Genesis this year. Those aforementioned players he struggled with so much in the past aren't out of the question for being defeated, as Tweak has been able to bring them down to Game 5s before. Diddy is definitely a more popular character in Japan, and Tweak's least favorite characters to fight are much more common overall, but he's shown time and time again he can do it, even when traveling outside of the US. 
Tweak is someone with a lot of experience in the game, so getting matchup checked is less of an issue than it is for other competitors. With his level of skill, you can only assume that if he doesn't run into Mia, Akola, or another Steve player, he'd likely perform very well. Now, the previous two members are easily contenders for best in the US along with Zamba, but the best fox in the world, Light, might have the strongest case of every competitor mentioned so far to make a strong run in Japan. If I go to Japan, I'm staying for at least two weeks because I'm going to I'm going to learn. You know, like I'm deleting Twitter. If I lose, I lose, but I will not come out a loser. I will come out in those top eights. All time, Light has been a bit more susceptible to losing to Japanese competitors than Tweak or even Shattuck have with quite a few even or losing records, but it's clear that his peaks are higher. With a 1-0 record over Hurt and being the only player mentioned so far to not just have an Akola win, but multiple wins over Mia as well, his hyper-aggressive style is a stark change from what we're used to out of the Japanese scene. What we do have to mention, just like for Tweak, is that many of Fox's worst matchups like Luigi, Game & Watch, and even the Ice Climbers are much more more common in Japan than the US. Unlike some of NA's other top competitors though, Light has proved on multiple occasions that he's capable of overcoming these obstacles at the highest level. What effects a player can differ from competitor to competitor. Some people feel like the longer they play, the hotter they get, while others fizzle out during long events due to a low level of mental stamina and focus. For Light, the former is likely to be true at an event like this. But for our next competitor, we have someone who has transcended mental stamina, a truly untiltable competitor. And despite being the only player mentioned so far that hasn't won a major this year, he's still seen as the final boss of NA Smash and perhaps our only hope of being able to conquer Japan, and that's Sonics. Depending on who you ask, they may just tell you that Sonics is the best player in the world. This year, as of Kageribi taking place, he has yet to win a major event, but he's quite possibly the most consistent player in the world right next to Akola. Second at Luminosity Makes Big Moves, Genesis X, the Luminosity Invitational, Level Up Expo, and Gommel X most recently, and he also got a decent sized win at the B tier CECC Made Madness the same weekend as Kageribi. What drives Sonics' prestige and namesake in this conversation are his records against Japan's best players. Other than a handful of 0-1 matchups he's accumulated over the years, Sonics has either an even or winning matchup with all of Japan's best players. In fact, that 0-1 is kind of relevant. None of them have managed to defeat him in more than a single set. Notice these incredible head-to-heads against both Akola and Mia, a huge factor to his number 3 ranking in 2023. He hasn't had the chance to fight either in 2024, but the results he's managed to get are nothing short of spectacular. He's beaten nearly every player that he's crossed paths with this year, and for the few that did manage to beat him, Sonics got his run back eventually. His playstyle is part of what makes this theoretical inclusion at a Japanese tournament so intriguing. Japanese players tend to be labeled as having a slow and calculated playstyle, something that Sonics has, um, gotten really good at. This is paired with having, honestly, one of the most consistent punish games in Ultimate, being able to flip the switch from a drawn-out game to three-stocking you in what feels like an instant. We did mention that he does tend to come second a lot, so him crashing out late into bracket is a concern. But what he has proven is that he is damn near a lock for Grand Finals at almost any event he attends, which is definitely what NA needs right now up against this titan of Japan. So, I guess we have to answer the question now. Is NA Smash cooked? Well, losing back-to-back -back P tiers is not a good look, but between the players that did make their way overseas and the ones we just mentioned, the North American scene has more than enough talent to win another Japanese major. In a perfect world, we'll get a 1992 Dream Team-esque line of players going to take on the next Umabura or Kageribi and at least give it their best shot. Because, hey, that's all you can ask for, right? But yeah, man, I don't know, they seem pretty cooked. <laughs> That's tough. Hey, thank you so much for watching, and let me know in the comments if you enjoy this type of content and want to see more of it. Subscribe if you're not already, and we'll see you in the next one.